Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Lazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we'll help you to build your dream team. So the idea of today is mainly to help you because we feel your pain when you are when you are asked to create a, a risk management file, a risk management uh, document or process, and then you are here alone saying, what should I do now? So what we'll do is that we'll talk about that and help you to build uh, or to find the right partners that can help you to then succeed on this uh, on this uh, on this task. And for that, I have with me Navin Agarwald from Creative Analytics Solution. So Navin, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Thank you, Munir. I'm so excited to be here with you again. Great. So yeah, last time you were here to discuss with us about benefit risk analysis for uh, for the risks uh, again. And today, yeah, we'll try to uh, explain to people the the process of creating risk management with a collaboration with other other people. But before that, can you just make a small introduction of yourself again? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Naveen Agarwal, and um, I have uh, been in the medical device industry for nearly 20 years now. Uh, I started my career in product development outside medical device industry, and then by accident found myself in quality management as a product quality manager. And I learned a lot about post-market safety surveillance of medical devices where I built these systems from scratch and I ran them. So I just didn't build the system, but I was responsible for running the system for about two years. So I learned a lot. And about five years ago, I started my own consulting practice focusing entirely on risk management. So Guys, my goal really is to collectively improve our capability in risk management across the industry. So I want to raise the bar. I want us to do it better so we can improve patient safety, accelerate innovation, and cut cost. Exactly. That is what I want to do. And and uh, Navin, you have also uh, some uh, live sessions that you are doing. You have some uh, videos that you are doing on your uh, on your uh, LinkedIn profile also. So don't hesitate, people, if you are listening here, to just go and follow Navin. I put also his details on the show notes if you want to get to know more about uh, what Navin is doing. But he has really a great contents, also YouTube channel with videos about risk management. So if you want to learn about risk management, uh, risk management, it is really the right person to go to. So. <laughs> So Navin, um, as I said, the idea of today is that uh, we we are always um, starting some of the of the discussion when we are starting to look at about registration of products, etc. To collect some documents, some information. Uh, do you have this test? Do you have the labeling? Do you have the instruction for us, etc. And then at one point we have because on the for example UMDR, but all the other uh, regions also. We are asked to provide the risk management file, for example. And here, sometimes we feel alone, if I can say, because we yes. are here saying, okay, I have to do that. Uh, how can I do that? What should I do exactly? You are following usually, we are following usually the ISO 14971 or for usability, the IEC 62366. But our teams are not really maybe aware of what is that and what, what, what should be there. So mainly, um, is this something that we can complete risk management mainly we can complete as a one person can i do it myself and then i will be fine i i can can provide a, a good a good document well monir i think the context matters right many small companies don't have a big staff they don't have a big team of people many startups are just starting out so in those environments it is possible to do risk management with a limited number of people and you asked me a question one person that is very challenging because now we are expecting this person to have expertise not only in the technical side of the product, but also regulatory side, quality side, clinical side. And it's difficult for one person to have that capability and it's not impossible, but difficult. There are many, many smart people out there. Uh, the thing that we have to remember is that the risk management truly is a team sport. And uh, sure, you can try to win the game with you know three, four players out, but you'll have to be exceptionally good at it. So uh, to short answer to your question is that possible, yes. Feasible, really no. And not you won't be able to do a good job. And I can see why people might find it difficult because they are often asked to take the whole load on themselves. Like you mentioned, someone from quality might be asked to just put together all the documentation for risk management file because they are being asked to do that. And it is a pretty heavy load to carry. Uh, and I think we should talk a lot more about collaboration in this conversation, how we can take the next step as the owner of the risk management process and encourage our organization to actually see the problem that we see, not as a complaint, 
like we don't want to complain that hey we are not capable of doing this job but help them see uh, how much of a load it is and the chances of success in meeting requirements and really improving patient safety so i hope that clarifies the context that i want to uh, share with people and the second thing very quickly i want to point to you uh, this notion of dream team actually is a good idea but it depends upon the stage of the life cycle of the product where you are and we'll talk a lot more about that today yeah exactly and uh, mainly um, what what we have is that we have to create a risk management file um it it's a building in in construction and if, if i can say it's always in construction or in maintenance so it's not something that is finished it's something that is building and then we have to change the color maybe change the thing or add more windows or whatever but at the end it's something that is always under construction so at the beginning maybe i suppose that if you are one man person you can start to build the architecture and framework of uh, risk management include some of the risks that you think can work uh, but i suppose also that it will not be optimal during an audit if you have an auditor that is really well experienced on all this, he may be surprised that this risk was not mentioned or that risk was not mentioned because on this industry, you know, for example, sterilization. So risk of infection, is it there? Uh, what about uh, the stability study? What about uh, the transportation? What about all this? So you may have some questions from an auditor also about why this is not there or why that is not there. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, you know, a more serious thing to consider in that situation is um, if the auditor begins to suspect that you don't have top management support. Because, you know, in, in the risk management system, ISO 14971 is very clear about top management responsibility. And you show the evidence of top management commitment through resources and personnel. And if the auditor begins to suspect that you really have not assigned enough resources and that's the reason why your risk management process is not delivering the results that it should, then they will actually, they should question top management. It's not a, it's not a matter of risk management anymore. Yeah. Now it's management responsibility, which is a much more serious question in an audit. You don't want to go there. Exactly, yeah, and and uh, as as you said on the ISO fourteen and seven one, there were a lot, there were a lot of mention about qualification of person doing their job, management responsibility, policy, etc. So this is really something that uh, yes is really uh, needed, and we hope the auditor will not think that management is really not uh, with you, and really your management should be with you on that um, yes. to help them. But I suppose you as the person also is requiring that. You have to tell your management that it's also the responsibility and not uh, letting them discover that by trying to read the eyes of 4971 because sure. I suppose they will never read that. So let me let me share a recommendation. Like let's say you are the only person responsible for risk management and quality both. And it, I have seen that. In many organizations, there's only one person. The first recommendation I would make is that get to know the requirements really well. Not just what the requirements are, but why. Why are they there? And then you develop a plan. Discuss that with your management and tell them exactly what is needed. I'm sure they'll push back on you. They say, you know, Naveen, you are telling me you need five people and a million dollars. I don't have that. Then you will say to them, it'll have, then let's consider the impact of that limitation on resources. Either it increases our timeline or it increases our risk of non-compliance. Which one are we going to take? So I think the point you are trying to make very nicely is it's our role. It's exactly. our job to make our management aware of the trade-offs they must make and what are the decisions they should take, right? No decision is perfect. No one has infinite resources, but it's our job to tell them the potential consequences of trade-offs that they are making. Exactly. We have yeah. to be transparent. And I would re strongly recommend that you uh, be very, very clear in your presentation to your top management so that they understand what you're trying to say. Yeah, exactly. Right? You should be very, very clear. Now, in the case, for example, you arrive to your management and you tell them, okay, I need five people or I need this money. And they say, okay, I will give that to you. The point now is, uh, do you think that there can be also still there some problems because the people that will be part of your team have no clue what is a risk management, have no clue of all this. So then 
there can be some barriers for yes. working with them and you can feel that I will, it will take less time if I do it myself than if I start to work with, ah. with other people also. Yes, yes. So it's a very good question. Uh, five people doesn't mean five random people. You need five competent people. And the competence is defined in a certain way. Uh, not everybody is competent in everything. So if you just get five people because they are the ones available, they have bandwidth, they have capacity, it's good because it's better than not having them. But then sit down and identify the gaps in their competence where you will struggle. Write it down on a piece of paper, the competence of each person, the gaps in their competence and what else you would still need. Maybe you don't have to hire a full-time person. Maybe you can get somebody from the outside. Maybe you can get trained yourself. So if you have a good plan based on the gaps that you have identified, I think you will be successful. But it's always good to get really competent people and balance them out, balance their competence, right? Uh, that's what we are shooting for. And it depends who we need. We don't need the same five people at all the stages in the life cycle of the product. During design and development, we need certain types of five people. During launch, we need another different types. Post-market, we need another, another different types. So we need to be very flexible in our resourcing plan because it depends upon what we are trying to do and where we are with the process. Okay, and um, in terms of uh, company, um, you have two types of companies also. You have the company that is more about um, go fast, try to get as the document that is needed just to pass the audits and to pass everything. And you have the company that says, we are really doing that because there is a purpose for the product, for the finished final patient, etc. So how can we deal with also this company, maybe culture or the, the objectives of each of those models here? I think the first thing we need to start talking about is that this is not either or. We have to be good at both. We have to be good at launching products fast which are safe and effective. And we also have to be good at defending our decisions and our documentation in an audit. It's not either or. So let's, that's not how, how I look at things. So if your company is emphasizing, first of all, companies made up of different functions, different departments, right? It's not, it's not like one, one company is, you know, just one purpose. It is possible that maybe one department is focused on compliance, the other department is focused on innovation and fast product launch, and you are caught in between. And that's where we'll talk about collaboration, you know, why collaboration is important. So we need to create a mindset as leaders of risk management practice that risk management is not either or, it's both. At the end of the day, we need to launch innovative products quickly, under budget, we need to make money, and we need to improve product safety. So it's all patient safety, innovation, and reduce cost, all of them, not one or the other. Exactly. Um, in terms of, uh, of projects like, uh, like that, so we have also sometimes people that are coming and asking us, oh, for this um, product, how can I, be because when we are trying to, to sell the, or to register the products, we have to show safety and compliance and everything. But we, ha we are asking also, okay, here, how can I prove that this product is okay? What kind of test I should do, uh, etc. So, And sometimes people are coming to me and say, oh, is there a standard for testing of these products, etc. Et so what would you answer to those people there? Yeah, so I think the answer would be, let's work together to define what the state of the art is. And the state of the art is not a static or a absolute idea. It's relative. It's in a context. State of the art in one place may not be the same as state of the art in another place. So let's understand where we are going to sell this product, which regulatory agencies are involved. How would we define state of... I think that conversation needs to happen first before we jump into what test to do, which standard to follow. And once you have developed that, sort of description of what you consider as the state of the art for that particular product in that context, then you begin to make a list of what it is that you are required to do or expected to do. And many regulatory, you know, I'm mostly familiar with FDA, not as much in, in Europe. FDA has, a, you know, go to any product code, you will find the list of consensus standards that they expect to be followed. 
they're not mandatory, but they are telling you what you should do. So once you have defined your you know, intended use, you know what the product cost is, you know what the state of the art is, you can make a list of all those things very, very quickly. Now, these are all open, as far as the idea is concerned, openly available information. Anybody, you don't have to be a regulatory expert, maybe a little bit knowledge. So that's the number one thing I would say, uh, resist the temptation to answer directly. Like you are not going to say do A, B, C, D, E, F, but first let's spend 30 minutes, one hour defining the state of the art in the context of the product we are selling. And then let me do a little bit of work. I can do some search. I can talk to people, make a list of standards, testing that we need to do. And then it could become very simple. I think we, my, my experience is that we jump right away into the how without first understanding the what and the why. So exactly. pull back a little bit and say, let's spend just an hour, two hours talking about what it is that we are supposed to do in the first place and, and I how we can define that. And I suppose this is not an, um, um, my, the reflection of one person. We should redo that with the, the team, the full team, so that they really understand where we are going. Yes. Because yes, asking some people to say, oh, can you create the risk management for me? Or can you answer the risk and this and that? Maybe out of context, you will not really understand what we are talking about. But if we put the full context, why we need that, where we need that, how we, we want to get that, here is examples of what other projects have done. Can we find some, some solution? As you said, there are some consensus standards, here are the standards, etc. This can give already some feeling to the team that they are part of this process yes. and they are not just uh, guided by you to say, oh, give me this line, give me that line. Yes. It's more coming with really their own uh, understanding of the process. And maybe out of the box, they can have some ideas or some yes. risks that they have identified without you telling them. And I think that brings the whole notion of collaboration, right? Collaboration happens when you communicate and when you enroll and engage, not direct. Like I could say, I need five people doing X, Y, Z. That's not collaboration. That's direction. Collaboration is when we work with those five people, develop a common understanding and engage them and enroll them for the common purpose. Like the common purpose is we need to produce a safe and effective product quickly. The common purpose is not necessarily we need to build a risk management file. That's one of the deliverables along the way. But if we can align ourselves on a common purpose, I think collaboration can happen very, very easily. Hey, just a second. Do you need a EU, Swiss or UK representative? Then choose Easy Medical Device. We can represent you and also become your importer. Contact us at eo at easymedicaldevice.com. Exactly. Yeah. Um, my next question is uh, a question that people are asking when we are saying, uh, okay, we need to do a risk management. It's... Uh, which methodology, which tool I need to use? Is it FMEA, like uh, we, we all know about that, or other any other tools that are existing? So is this really the important question to ask here, or is there some more important question to, to look at? I think the first question we should ask is, um, what what is risk management in the first place, right? Uh, and in, in our industry, we really focus on safety risk management for good reason because that's required for regulatory purposes. And we want to be safe, but risk is beyond safety. So first we should define what we are talking about, what is in the context of risk management. So let's let's make the assumption that we're gonna focus on safety risk management. Then we should understand the state of the art 14971 standard and the guidance TR 24971. We should really understand it, not just know it, but understand it. So once we understand, I think we need to start thinking about developing a capability first, which is driven by a process and also the management support. So develop a process and capability. Tools are part of it. Like think about it. Let's say let's say you want to build a building. You, you gave that example, very nice example, right? Um, before you build a building, you need a roadmap. You won't say I need, you know, this type of paint or I need these types of nails. I need this type of lumber. First, you will say, what kind of building I want? So we need to do that work up front. And unfortunately, I think we are not spending enough time on that. We're not spending enough time because we are so busy. Everyone is trying to do everything quickly with low, re low amount of resources. We are constantly fighting fire. So we are not able to build capability and systems. 
but it should be part of organizational priority. Some people should be thinking about that. Otherwise, uh, you may build the building, you know, quickly, it won't be good enough, but you won't be able to build more buildings. You won't be able to build different kinds of buildings. But if you have the capability, so to answer your question very quickly, I would say tools come a little bit later, but you should have a general idea. And I think if you look at ISO TR 24971, it gives you a list of potential tools. Don't jump on one tool versus the other right away. Be aware of what is out there. You don't, maybe you don't have to get all the tools, but you are aware. Build the capability and then decide what tools you will need for the job you're supposed to do. So that would come a little bit later, I think, but the awareness should be there if that helps you understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah completely. And uh, because I have this experience where people are coming to me and say, oh, I need to build the risk management of my company. Do you have a template for that? Do you have a table uh, that I should use? Which column I should have on it? It's like, let's jump directly on filling this table like a formula yes. or like a template that I just feel like I have it now. I can send it and I, I'm done. I, I've done my job, which is not really what is really asked by the ISO 14971. There should be first a plan, uh, how you plan things, even before you have to have the policy of your right. company about the, the different uh, level of risk, then the plan, then uh, the analysis of the arms before, then the analysis of uh, the the action, the mitigation, etc. So, there is really uh, step one, step two, step, step three one. to follow. But I have some people that are jumping directly to, oh, let me give you me the table and I will fill it and I will brainstorm uh, yeah. what are the risks and, and then move forward without looking at it. So I, I think I would say, I think to that, what I would say is that obviously we also need to, to ask them uh, what templates are you looking for yeah. and what are you trying to accomplish? Because this answer will not be satisfactory to them if someone is looking for a quick fix. Uh, telling them about a, you know building capability will not be satisfactory. So we can ask them at what stage you are yeah. in your process. And if they are in the very early stage, we can say, okay, fine, I'll give you a template. But this template is a risk management plan that we should work first. Don't ask me for an FMEA template. We'll decide that later. But since you are so early, I'm going to give you a risk management plan template. Let's work on it together. I think that could be more collaborative with them and help them understand, hey, this person is really trying to solve my near-term problem, but also positioning me for success in the long term. Maybe that's how we could address that. Yeah, exactly. And um, we, we also jump a bit ahead in terms of the process. Before all that, um, if you are following also the ISO 13485, you have to have a procedure on how you are doing your risk management, not for Correct. this building, but for all the building that you will be yes. creating within your company. This one is the risk management plan for this building with the uh, analysis for this building, the report for this building. But if you have another building, as you said, to create, you have to have like a, a pattern, like a procedure to say each time you create a risk management, you have to do first this, then second that, etc. So you have also to have a procedure maybe with templates, as we are talking about templates, yeah. that are existing within your company for, for doing that. And if we don't have it, maybe that's the first place to start, right? And if you think about it, really a procedure is really, is really a, a documentation, a reflection of your process. So you need to have the process first, proceduralize it, tweak it, refine it, and then execute it for a certain building in this case, like with a risk management plan. Now, to somebody, it might seem like, oh, there's a lot. that's a lot of work. Can I not just do it quickly? You know, I really have to do it quickly. Can you just give me a couple of templates? I think I would still kind of listen to them and say, uh, okay, fine. Let's start with a risk management template, plan template that I think is, is good. But along the way, let's understand that we also need to have a procedure. We also need to have other aspect of risk management. And maybe at the end of this whole thing, you should plan that your output should also be a procedure. So, I wouldn't necessarily say, okay, build the procedure first. It's ideal that they have a procedure, but if they don't have it, they should still do risk management, right? Do it correctly. Exactly. And that's where I think we can help them and collaborate with each other. Exactly. And um, the idea is also that it's not only you as quality and regulatory affairs that understand this procedure, this template and everything, but also the other people that will be part of your team that they are also on this on this and they really have an understanding of, of the process to follow, of the templates to fill, of the information that should be inside, of the finality of all this, why, what we will do with all that, etc. So the full, I mean, I suppose the training also is needed for, for those people. 
Yeah, but you see, this is exactly why if you start with the risk management plan first, you'll be able to answer all those questions right away. Otherwise, you won't be able to complete that template if the template is good, right? If like, the template is good, what it's meant to do, you'll actually have to answer all those questions. Who are the people? What are the capabilities, competence I, I want? What activities they'll be doing? When? What will be the deliverable? How will I measure if it is acceptable or not? Who's going to make that decision, right? Right. And how will I evaluate if I have reached the end goal? What is the end goal? What are my criteria? All those questions will have to be answered. And if the template is good, even without a procedure, what I'm telling Munir, as a practical matter, is you could start with a risk management plan and build your infrastructure around it so that now you are uh, capable of achieving success uh, in all aspects of your quality management system. So it could be done in parallel. You don't have to wait for a procedure to be established first. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, in terms of dream team now, as we talked about that, so um, for, if I can say a standard project, um, maybe for like, let's let's take an example of a medical device, like an implant that is has some electronics inside that is implanted within the patient. Um, and then that, um, yeah, that has to be working uh, through electricity or, or this and that. So can we define for, for this example specifically, because as I said, there are so many products that um, we can have many dream teams. For this kind of example, what can be an example of a dream team of people that really can help you to achieve correctly the risk management and to provide you with all the answers that you need for answering to the, to the requirements of the regulation? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And again, I'll go back to the risk management plan. Identify which stage in the life cycle of the product you are. If you are very early on, you are in the conceptual feasibility stage, you really don't need a whole lot of people. You just need to first prove the concept and that's mostly engineering folks. Do you have something that is potential likely to work? Do you have a definition of intended use? So early on, there'll be a lot of regulatory input, engineering input, right? Not as much as, not as much quality, not even as much as risk management. That's very early. But yeah. when you begin design control, when you have said to yourself, this is what I'm going to work on. This is where I'm going to start design control. Now you have to put together a risk management plan. And in this particular case, you will probably want engineers who have experience with a similar product, electromechanical components. They are aware of technology, right? It may not be exactly the identical product, but something similar. They should understand how technology works. What are some of the potential designs they might want to look at? You definitely want those people in the beginning. You definitely want a regulatory expert right in the beginning to develop a strategy because what's the finish line, guys? The finish line is safe and effective product in the context of the intended use. The definition of intended use that the benefit risk expectations from regulatory authorities, that's a strategic question. I think you must answer that right away in the early on, as soon as possible. Have a strategy. What's the, what's the goalpost? Where are, where are you going to end? It should not be like a fanciful imaginary idea. Uh, put everything together the best. You know, you don't have to make like the top of the line product if that's not your, what your strategy. So that should be part of the dream team. Now you have started, let's say you have started working on this. You have a couple of prototypes. You're beginning to test. First, prove the feasibility from a, from a functional specs. Establish the functional specs quickly. And then also evaluate the potential safety considerations right in the beginning. And that could change, by the way. That could adapt over time. They are not fixed in stone. Make sure it works. Make sure you have some data that tells you the design is kind of, you are able to scale that, right? You will still need a lot of engineering support and development support. But now regulatory people are no longer required in that stage because you already know what the strategy is. Yeah. Now, let's say you have, you know, done all this work, you are very confident it's going to work. Maybe it's about time to do a clinical study to get some clinical data. You should have involved those clinical experts for a limited period of time early on to decide upon a broad strategy, not a big strategy, but a little bit of input. But now you are at a point where you have to design a clinical study. You need to have manufacturing people involved. You need to have clinical people involved, right? Um, then you go, so do you see the composition of the dream yeah. team is changing based on the life cycle. Now you are actually about to launch. Make sure you have your risk management file ready 
make sure you have all the documentation ready. And these people are probably working partially. They're not part of the core team, but maybe partially. So project management also becomes important. I don't know, along the way, your dream team should have a very good project manager. If you are the only person, make sure you learn a little bit of project management skills, at least to be able to execute that and inform the stakeholders, get the resources you want. Because at the end of the day, the success of the project will depend upon you. Now we are at launch, and let's say we are, we are post-launch. During the launch phase, you have to have intense regulatory participation, right? You're gonna prepare yep. the documentation, uh, go to the regulatory authorities, maybe have audits. Like if you are working with uh, uh, notified bodies, maybe they'll have to go through that process so the quality people are also involved. Now let's talk about post-market, right? All your engineering people have probably moved on to the next new innovation that they're working on. You don't have those resources available anymore. Make sure you put that in the plan as your post-market surveillance activities. This is where I coach people in my training courses is that plan for the life cycle aspect of your risk management, not just at launch, right? So you're going to say in post-market, my dream team should include 20% of the time commitment from product developers who worked on this project. Make sure you have secured that. Otherwise, you'll probably be struggling when some design changes need to be made based on post-market information. In post-market, you need to have your complaints handling people involved. You need to have statistics. Maybe somebody with the not fancy statistics, basic statistics is okay, but sometimes you may have to do some fancy statistics. So make sure you have those capabilities. And again, somebody like this is what my experience was in post-market surveillance when I established that is that you need one person who, who, who can tie it all up. And then you need to have medical safety people because they need to be evaluating every signal from the marketplace to determine if it's relevant to the safety or not. So long story short, Muni, I think we need to be aware of the composition of the dream team uh, as flexible. And somebody, and I call that as a risk management practitioner, this is, this is the people I teach, I train them. Project management skills and the overall awareness, end to end, they need to be aware, not really expert, but aware so that they can pull different resources at different times. So uh, long answer to your uh, very, very precise question, but I don't, I don't want people to make the mistake that it'll be the same fixed team all across. Flexibility is very important. And that is why I cannot overemphasize collaboration in this, right? Collaboration is very, very important. No, I agree with you. And the, uh, the, the answer is, is perfect because, yeah, we, we are experiencing that when we are doing a project. At the beginning, we have a, 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 just an idea on a paper, then we don't need to have everybody there. But at the end, we have more people that are working because we have the phase of design, but we have also the phase of manufacturing. So we have to transfer all the design to manufacturing. There can be also some risks there with this process or that process. So there are a lot of different phases on the project. And yes, each phase has its own people. But as you mentioned also, what is also important, even post-market, you are still continuing to gather information oh, that yes. you add to risk management and to maybe include additional risks that you haven't identified before. So then you have to have also the right people to do that also. So yeah, it's really, uh, I think, a complete answer. And I think- I think that is where people are kind of really um, missing the boat. There's a lot of opportunity for, for finding the right people in post-market phase because there's a lot of excitement and focus during product development. Everybody exactly. is excited. But once the product is launched, people forget about it. And that's where that's where you run into your problems with a dream team, right? Exactly. Uh, the last one thing I wanted to point out here is that let's understand that people are not robots. Yeah. It's not an on-off switch. So plan for when a new resource will be required, plan for onboarding. Start working early, get them involved, get them to attend some meetings to absorb the knowledge, the work that has been done, bring them up to speed. Don't just expect them to deliver what you what what you're asking them to do just with a flip of a switch. So be you know be very aware of how people uh, are expected to perform. They maybe have other projects they are working on in a big company. Everybody works on multiple projects, so you need to be aware of their time commitments, their obligations, and you need to work with them. Sure, sure, no, great. So really, thank you for that, uh, that Navin. So you you talked about your courses, so. Uh, for people that want to know more about risk management or to be maybe to learn or to get more experience about that. So um, can they attend your course? So you, you have open course that uh, they can go for? Yes. Yeah, so let me, before I talk about the courses, let me share with you my kind of um, approach. Yeah. Uh, 
my approach is slightly different than what you might find out there in the industry with these so-called kind of intense certification courses. Yeah, uh, I do offer certification for my courses, but my approach is like a staircase model, right? So um, what I would like, what when I work with people, mostly, you know, I'd like to understand where they are in their risk management journey and kind of help them decide how they should proceed. For example, if you are, if you don't know anything, First thing you must learn is the language of risk management, which is vocabulary. So I have a risk management fundamentals course, which is an on-demand video course, um, very affordable. You can find that on my website. You can learn on your own, but first understand the terminology before you jump into ISO 14971, right? And then I have an on-demand ISO 14971 full requirements course, clause by clause with practical examples. That's also on-demand, very, very affordable. And then finally, what I have for people is a live, live training. And I don't do uh, eight hours each day for two days. That's not how people understand and absorb information. I do two hours weekly for five weeks. And we are actually building a risk management file from scratch using a case study example and my proven templates. So we are actually doing the work not only understanding, but you won't be able to get value out of that course unless you have gone through some basic fundamental training. Exactly, yeah, no, I agree. With and that. that's not the end of it, Munir, because I don't think that you will be, you'll develop skills just by attending a course. I think skill is developed over time. Yeah. And that is where a lot of my focus is right now through my newsletter, where we are sharing case studies, warning letters. We are sharing, uh, let's say, recall notices. We are sa sharing safety notices and we are analyzing them and our, our Friday conversations that we talked about. So this is an ongoing learning. So the new model that I'm proposing to people, Munir, is very quickly, instead of spending thousands of dollars on a certification course, think of this as an year long learning experience for you at less than half the cost. Sure. But I'm, and along the way, getting your certification too. So this is my commitment and promise to people is that at much lower cost, I can actually help you build real practical skills, not just a piece of paper that tells you you are certified. So I wanted to share that approach with your audience so that there's full understanding of how I can help them really build competence and risk management and not just give them a piece of paper, which is, in my opinion, six months down the road is practically meaningless. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's great because as we talked before about this a creation of a dream team or uh, the skills that we should have, etc. I think, yeah, having a great understanding of um, the standard of, of the the what is risk management, etc. The culture of it or the the mindset of it is really important. So, I think having some courses like that or even just participating to your newsletter uh, can be um, more affordable, as as I said, to get some learning and to uh, have also some uh, some knowledge that are uh, dripped in, if I can say, slowly instead of a full pack yeah. of a truck that is hitting you with all those information. <laughs> and you know, Munir, what I'm finding uh, as I talk to more people is that they are coming and telling me, I don't have anybody I can go and ask a question. Yeah. If I have questions, where do I go? And that's what I tell them. You become part of the Let's Talk Risk community and I offer you a monthly webinar where you can come and join, learn deep about a topic and ask questions. So I tell them, once you take a course from me, it is not a one-time transaction. You are part of my sort of community. Exactly. And I support you. You can email me anytime. You can contact me anytime. I think that's what people are struggling with. They're pe str struggling with ongoing support. Sure. And they, they just don't have a credible resource. And that's what my focus is. No, it's, it's really great. And um, I, I will put all the all the links on the show notes uh, so that uh, if, if you have any question, you can directly uh, go to uh, Navin. Uh, you can go also to the websites that uh, he has, uh, the newsletter and everything so that you can uh, visit by yourself and check by yourself all the all the content. But as I've told you, so Navin has also a YouTube channel, so you can also check there all the information he provides and you'll see that really he's really an expert on, on risk management and he's talking a lot about that. So it will be really helpful to you to be part also of, uh, of, his, uh, of his community for, for that. Okay, Navin, it was really a pleasure to have you. Um, thanks for all this... Uh, uh, the answer that you provided, I'm, I'm, I hope 
This will be helping people that are now getting this answer of create my risk management, which who should be on my team? How can I do that to make them also aware that, yes, it's not just a one time process. It's a step by step. And uh, at each step, there are different people. So you don't have to struggle to try to have one team for six months that is coming and, and doing things, but more um, people that can come and go uh, at each phase of the of the process. But uh, really, I, I hope it will be helping some people like that. If it's helped just one person, it's already great. So. Yes. Yes, I hope so too. Thank you, Munir. Thank you, Naveen, and I wish you a nice day. You take care. Bye-bye. Okay.